to just watch your language. All right. <laughs> so we, we can now talk all about English breakfast now that uh, we are live. Awesome. So. Awesome. Uh, Stephen, what, what, what constitutes a proper English breakfast? Um, I would say bacon, proper um, back bacon rather than the like streaky bacon that you have here. Um, sausage, fried eggs, baked beans, like maybe um, hash browns, um, fried tomatoes. Um, what are those? Right. Um, they're, they're kind of like, <laughs> like, kind of like, they're like fried like, tomatoes, oh, but see. more English. <laughs> more English. <Yeah. laughs> um, what, what makes a proper back bacon? I'm not a big fan of mushrooms, but yeah, that too. It's not streaky bacon. What, yeah, what, 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 makes it, what makes the bacon different? What, how is it um, different? It's back bacon, and so it's much thicker. And um, so it's pretty much all meat with just like a thin piece of um, fat around the side. So um, it's okay. probably closer to Canadian bacon in terms of its consistency. Um, yeah. We do have the your kind of bacon stuff going in the UK, but um, we call it streaky <laughs> bacon. Um, but I much prefer the English version of bacon just because there's a lot more meat to it. Gotcha. I see. All right. Well, if anybody is watching this live, then uh, please go ahead and ask questions in the chat. And Carrie is standing by ready to um, basically read the questions out to us. And we're going to we're going to take them as they come. So um, go for it. Hopefully I, I, I might need your help, uh, Stephen, in finding these. <laughs> I still have you, did you the click chat. into the video so that it's big? I think so. Uh, <laughs> second. I'll send you a link directly to it. So that should be okay. okay. There Perfect. We go. I'll click that one. All right. It does look like there are a few uh, questions there now, as far as I can tell. So any moment now, we'll start answering them. Um, you might as well pick the first one and then I'll find the rest. <laughs> <laughs> Seems fair. Seems fair. Just see them. Okay. All right. Perfect. Tyler asks, if you all could completely start over in this game, what would you what would your first five cards be? What would your first five cards be? Who wants to answer this mm -hmm. one? Not I, it. I think I think I think Tim wants to answer it. It looks like <laughs> it. I see it on his face. Yeah, that was yeah. No, totally. That's exactly what you thought. <laughs> um, you know, honestly, I think that's that's such a difficult and I'm and and I don't mean to. Do the traditional punt but it is really difficult to say because there's so many revolving bonuses that exist the bonuses change so much i haven't gotten out you know the last year my sign up bonus has been almost exclusively american express say 85 percent american express just because they've been so lucrative and so it's hard to say you know, if I were going to go back and say, what are my, what would my first five cards be without necessarily saying the five cards, I would probably have hit chase more intentionally at the beginning, because what I did originally is I just was signing up for, you know, I do the apparama every three months and I would sign up for 12, 15 cards a year. And all of a sudden there was all these chase cards that I didn't realize I wanted at the beginning that I now had. So I would probably pay more attention to that. And I probably would have gotten into business cards earlier. Um, because I think business cards are just a, they're lucrative, the way they don't impact chase five, the, the 524, the way they don't, uh, uh, report, uh, spending to your personal credit report. So anyway, all that to say, I think that, I think that probably what I would have done is concentrate on chase first and been more conscious of business cards, as opposed to necessarily having a, um, a firm five cards. Well, rather than the uh, kind of spitfire uh, one to the next, we're going to try to go through the questions more quickly. So uh, Tim mm -hmm. gets to pretend that his answer was the empirically best answer, and we will move Which, on. Which, I mean, obviously, two. you can tell by the nods <laughs> that it was. It totally was, yeah. Everybody <laughs> it was the best answer that any of us gave tonight. Yeah. <laughs> yeah <true>. <laughs> <laughs> we all agree on that. <laughs> so our next question here. Hey, guys, hope everyone is well. Somewhat Nick mentioned the... Uh, somewhere, Nick mentioned the Amex Biz Platinum as a keeper for the 35% rebate on flights. This puzzles me. In which situations are you buying flights with your Ritz or CSR for the travel protections, i.e. trip delay coverage? Secondly, what travel life protections do you guys use from your credit cards and which cards do you use? 
Okay, I well, I, that I, I guess that yes, yes. So I, I guess that falls on me. Uh, I don't remember saying that the business platinum was a keeper because of the thirty-five percent, but it is a very valuable benefit because essentially with a thirty-five percent rebate, you're getting one and a half cents towards paid flights. Now, the reason that could be interesting, at least the last couple of years, is because business class flights were pretty inexpensive. Now with airfares going up, that may not be as good anymore. Although on the flip side with award availability so far down, uh, maybe that pumps it back up. I recently wrote about how I booked flights for fewer points than the awards would have cost and I'll earn points on them. So I use that when it's advantageous, when it's better than booking an award ticket. Most of the time, in my experiences, an award ticket's a better deal. So I'm using the Ritz or the Sapphire Reserve to pay the taxes when I book an award ticket. I'm not usually booking paid flights with those, although I, I mean, I have before when the, the value wouldn't uh, work out because of course with the business platinum 35% rebate, you can only use that on your chosen airline and economy class or any airline in business or first. But if you're booking something elsewhere in the world, you wouldn't be able to use that rebate. If you were booking an economy class, rather, I should say somewhere else in the world, you wouldn't be able to use the rebate. So then you might use the Sapphire Reserve or the Ritz card if you're booking a cheap flight within Europe or Asia or something like that. So I think that covers my bases with that, I think, right? Sounds good. good. We've got the nods. All right, okay. on to question three. Uh, my wife and I each had US Bank gratis and rewards. Obviously not my wife. <laughs> Everyone knows I don't have a wife, I have a husband. My wife and I each ha had US Bank gratis and rewards cards. One of us had the business version, which was now converted to a triple cash rewards card, while the personal changed to a US Bank Altitude Go card. Are either of these cards worth keeping? Also, we still have never received any notice from US Bank that the Radisson cards were being replaced. Can we still cancel the cards, get a refund, and possibly apply for them for a sign-up bonus in the future? Hmm. Right. To start questions. with, who 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 has in mind what the benefits are of those two cards? I because uh, all I remember is the four percent dining. I think from the leverage. Yeah, uh, I, I think triple cash gives you three percent on. Is it your top spend category? or something. I can't remember exactly what it is. I've got one of those and they sent it to me recently and I took a quick look, but I haven't actually used it since just because yeah. there aren't any categories where that it makes sense to put any spend on that over other cards. Um, and so, I mean, I'm planning on keeping it just because it certainly doesn't harm, like cause any harm to have US bank cards and they don't have any annual fee. And so I'm going to be keeping mine around and maybe just put one or two transactions a year on it. Um, Having said that, though, it might make sense to cancel them if you want the um, sign-up bonus. Again, I'm assuming that you can get the bonus. Um, I don't yeah. think it's going to be like Amex, where it's they're going to class that as a once-per-lifetime kind of deal, where you've now effectively had the card, and so you can't get the bonus. I think you should be able to, provided you cancel. Yeah. I'm going to just uh, very quickly to say the use case for me recently, just recently on my trip abroad, I used my Amex gold card most of the time because I was earning points for dining there. Uh, however, I used the Altitude Go card that US Bank sent me when that card wasn't accepted, when the Amex wasn't accepted because 4% was a good return, no foreign transaction fee. Obviously, I could have gotten that with the Sapphire Reserve and gotten three points per dollar, but my wife doesn't always carry that in her wallet and, and it's her card and I can't always count on her to have it. So the Altitude Go went in my wallet and I used it a few times because 4% is a good return to me. Undone. You didn't want to use your Brex card there? Well, I mean, I, I could have done that also, but I haven't put any more money in my Brex account since it's getting closed. So that's what I would have done in the past, but now. Ooh, salt in the, the wound. Go. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, next up, Mike Gross says, hi, everyone. I got the business platinum and I remember MX had a spend counter for the signup bonus. Do they still have it? And does the spending from the credits uh, count towards the signup bonus? I don't remember. I have no idea if they the still have spending counter recently on a business plan. Yeah, I haven't on, seen that. Um, the only spending counter I've seen is on like the Spire card. I assume it's on the Delta cards also, probably for the yeah. free night each year. Mm. There's like a right. 60K. Right. And then there's the spending counter for the 75,000 on the Platinum yeah. to, to have <laughs> like guest access to the Centurion Lounge but I haven't seen a sign-up bonus counter. Mm. Yeah. What about the, do cr the credits count towards the sign-up bonus? I, towards the sign-up bonus? I, I assume it means the spend. Like the airline fee credit. So if you spend 200 on mm -hmm. uh, you know, Travel Bank, then does that 200 count towards a sign-up bonus? I think that it does. 
but I personally wouldn't want to risk it just in case Amex decides to turn around and say, no, nah, you got the credit. So I would just spend an extra 200 or however yeah, much, depending on which credits cool. um, you're going to be using just to play safe. Agreed. Way too much risk. <laughs> you're not going to risk 100,000 plus <laughs> points on $200 in, in, yeah. in purchases. Just make the additional purchases. Absolutely. Yeah. All right. Next, we've got a question from Tyler. Uh, how many Amex cards can you safely cancel after a year without landing in pop-up prison? Three. No, I, <laughs> <laughs> I love it. No, there's no known specific? answer. <laughs> there's no known answer to that. So, we, we don't so, know what, what weird algorithm Amex uses and, and uh, why why they put you into Amex prison and um, what and what situations you are you are barred from because people who are in pop-up prison for one type of sign-up bonus um, might be able to get other cards uh, successfully. So, And also, like doing a retention chat, I think you'd be hard-pressed to end up having three cards renewing this year where you didn't get any kind of right. incentive to keep mm. it. It may not be that the Good incentive point. is quite enough to warrant that, but I would certainly do an online chat just to see um, whether or not it's worth keeping the card or not. No. Yeah, yeah. Good point. Uh, next up, good question from Anthony Vaz. Any plans to have a live meetup uh, for drinks and points chat this summer somewhere in the U.S. or Canada? If so, when and where? Yeah, I mean, the, the short answer is we don't have any plans, um, but it's it's certainly something we're, we're open to doing. We, we've been floating the idea of doing it in conjunction with the Three Cards, Three Continents um, challenge, uh, but whether whether it'll line up with all of our travels to, to be able to do that, we don't know yet. So uh, again, I, I don't think we can, we have like a, a good answer for that because we can't say, Hey, show up this place at this time. Well, we do, but... we, no, we don't have any plans. <laughs> <laughs> Great answer. Don't have any plans. That doesn't answer. mean we can't have any plans. We can't well, come we up with any to book right. stuff. So we know what dates are involved. What's that? We need Nick to book his stuff so that we know uh, what people <laughs> Nick's, That's right. Nick's been I sitting do. around not yeah. not bothering with right. the whole challenge. Yeah, right. Just like, <laughs> right. I've been spending any time trying to put together any oh, right, exactly. plan award bookings. It's just yes. right, right. It's been like six hours trying to make <laughs> Every time I'm like, oh, one day just doesn't work right. I just need one one day of availability that's not there. Uh, okay, I think I have it though. I think I have it all now. I just haven't I, I haven't been able to book it yet. So but I think that, I that one. That that one flight is not going to go away while we're while we're doing this right, right now. <laughs> so, so no worries, Nick. <laughs> well, you know, I was just about to get on the phone and try to handle it. And I had totally uh, forgotten about this, and I got the notification uh, about this, and I was like, "Oh, okay, all right, I'm not going to handle that right now." <laughs> it actually so, would have been a pretty funny uh, ask us anything if if like Nick's like on the phone the whole time. <laughs> guys, I'm on all like, excuse me, excuse me. What's uh, up, to yes. book? <laughs> So yeah, All right. we should know soon. All right, next I'm gonna, up. Um, interrupt for another question from Mike Gross. Any clue on how long a bank keeps you on their blacklist uh, after closing all of your accounts? For example, US Bank in this case. I guess it depends I, on the content. Yeah, did you close it. the accounts or did they close? They closed it. And yeah. if they closed Sounds it like, before, yeah. so it would depend on, um, I think that would be a big factor. Yeah, I think that's probably hard for us to say. And I think it varies. Like, you know, Chase, I've, I've often heard that it may be for life, that there may not be an, a, a getting out of that. Uh, whereas with Amex, people have found uh, the ability to get back in after X number of years. But again, it depends. Like, I think I've always heard that if you, they close your accounts because you didn't pay them uh, with Amex, that you'll have to pay, I think, before they'll let you open another Amex mm -hmm. account. It's not like uh, bankruptcy wiping it away in seven years, it's gone. Like it might be the case with other issuers. What I've always heard is that Amex demands you pay it even if it's old before they'll reopen a card. So so I don't, I, I, again, like there's so many variables. Did US Bank close you down because you were MSing too much, they shut you down because you didn't pay your bill. And, uh, and then I, who knows? Uh, hard to say. Hard to say. It's worth trying, though. I mean, like, I, and that's what I've said in the past to people is the, the bump, the hit to your score for applying for one card is like what, five points? And it's like a six month bump or something in general. I mean, obviously, it depends on some other factors. I don't make the algorithms, but it's a small enough blip on the radar that it's worth trying every now and then to see. 
And right. with US Bank, I think if you open a checking, it depends on if you're looking to get a business card or a um, personal card, opening a business checking or a personal checking, I think is meant to help with US Bank too. And so um, I would do that first and then maybe a few months down the line, then apply for a credit card and hopefully that'll give you a better chance of success. All right. Great suggestion. Sounds good for now. Uh, next up, Kevin Joshua. Is it tempting to you, one of you, to get the Aeroplan card to produce status and then match it to another airline, Big Three Domestic? No. Uh, so, so we we all have we all have some <laughs> level of American Airlines status uh, and are working towards getting higher levels. So, if if we needed to match from something, we we could be matching from American uh, to elsewhere. And of course I have Delta high level status that I can match to other things as well. Um, I will say one thing that's, that is tempting to me about the aeroplane card is they put out that thing saying, if you spend, I think it was like, no, if you earn 30,000 points by mm, November 1st, maybe it was, then you get to another year of whatever status you have now. And I currently have temporarily like their 75 K status, um, through a backdoor thing that was a PR thing that, that I attended. And um, so I would love to be able to get that card and, uh, and, and earn the 30 K so I could keep it another year, but um, I'm over 524 and, and Chase won't approve me. Mm. Having said that, I feel like I've heard some data points of some of their co-vendor cards not getting affected by 524. And I think Airway Plan might be one of the ones that's not affected by it, but I'm not 100% sure on that. I haven't put it in an application to um, buy yeah, it out. But, I, but I threw one in, but I didn't. It might be worth a punt if that is something um, that's of interest to you because you might still be able to get it. Right. I did try, was rejected. Oh, you did? Oh, okay. Oh, yeah. Shoot. Mm. Wah, 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 <laughs> wah. <laughs> All right. Uh, with that, on to Ryan Delaney. Um, what are the risks to booking two award tickets separately when the overall cost would be less than booking them together due to fair buckets? Doesn't make sense to me. Hopefully it makes sense to you guys. <laughs> I don't think there's a risk, is there? Oh, okay. I mean, outside of uh, uh, Oh, well, no. So, so two together, I don't <laughs> think he means like, um, I, I think he means two people, right? So the, the oh. risk would... Oh, the, the risk, the risk would be that oh, if there's, if there's ah, irregular operations, yes. uh, getting routed different ways. So you don't get yeah. to fly together yep. when, when things go wrong. Um, you can probably get the airline to like, you know, annotate the tickets to say these, these people are flying together, but there's no guarantee that that will mm. keep them together when things go wrong. So, so I guess the risk is, uh, it depends um how okay you are with flying separately like if it's you when you're like four-year-old kid you probably don't want to do that right well maybe you do <laughs> 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 just kidding All right. buddy i love you <laughs> it was your mom that talked about flying without you <laughs> Um, next up, Derek Woods says, um, do you think any of the branded Amex Platinums will increase the sign-up bonuses to match the vanilla to stay competitive with the crazy deals on the vanillas? I'm going to give a categorical no, no, just in the hopes that that will mean that it'll become a yes. So, <laughs> <laughs> I agree. Right. Agree. But don't yeah, I don't think that they will. <laughs> Got to take a second to dig up another question. One moment. All right. Let's... Can I let, let's go back. I'm I'm curious to 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 touch on the aeroplane question one more time. Let's say mm. if Greg and Stephen, if you did not have status, mm. would you then be tempted? I personally wouldn't, just because I don't fly enough domestically in order to warrant doing that, and because it's somewhat easy to generate American Airlines status from scratch now, just through spend and through doing the various loyalty point steals and simply miles and things like that i'd probably be more inclined to focus on that but then again just because there's no guarantee that getting aeroplan status will get you a status match with any of the big three programs here so even if you get it then you may still end up being out of luck possibly yeah and i wouldn't be interested i mean the level of status you can get through uh the aeroplan card is so low that um 
you know, if it's not also buffeted by a lot of flying that what could you match to is like the bottom tier of other airlines. And you could get almost as good just by getting the co-branded credit card in most cases. Right. Right. Uh, next up is another uh, Amex question, if we're ready. Mm -hmm. um, Andrew Ross says, which Amex transfer partners charge award booking fees? I know Air Canada and Avianca do. Any other airlines? Has anybody question. been working award, award travel with Amex partners lately? <laughs> 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 You know, I don't ever look at the breakdown as to how much of it is taxes and how much of it is the partner booking uh, fee or whatever. So I don't normally even think about it that hard. Uh, so I, and nobody charges some, a fee that's significant to me on anything other than domestic ticket, right? That only really be, feels significant on a domestic ticket. I feel like on an international ticket, 25 bucks on an international business class award or whatever to me is just like such a negligible amount that I don't pay close enough attention when it's a domestic award. I could see where that comes into play because you know, that on top of the $5 in taxes maybe is something, but yeah, I don't know off the top of my head. Do you know? And, I mean, in, in theory, you've got Delta where um, they charge the excise fee uh, right. for transferring. And I think that they do that for JetBlue as well. Maybe um, I've never transferred to JetBlue from MX, but I think that they do. So do although it's not, an award booking fee it's an indirect award booking fee just because you have to um pay that when transferring it so that's another right right with um, amex that's specific to the airlines that are Amer you know american-based airlines uh which is delta hawaiian JetBlue. i think that's it mm -hmm. of their are there any partners. Are, are there any that charge an award booking fee that's like more significant than 25 or 30 bucks i feel like the award booking fees Maybe it's got an award booking fee. Um, it's a pretty small amount, I mean, right? I guess so. flying blue in that you can't actually book any kind of award ticket that costs less than what 150 bucks in cash. And um, no, that's not even true because you can book Air, 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 Europa, like just, Air um, Europa for ten dollars and ten cents right. in tax departing the United right. States. So, uh, <laughs> I mean, you're right. They do have obviously mm -hmm. surcharges on their own flights. So yeah, I mean, there's plenty of airlines that have fuel surcharges. If that's the core, like, you know, carrier and post surcharges, if that's the question, then we can talk about that. But I thought the question here was award booking fees, yeah. right? So yeah. Yeah, I'm not aware of any others, but that I, I was surprised, not, not because it was like a big fee, but that there was like a 15 or 20, I think it was $25 fee on booking the around the world award. Um, I just oh, yeah. hadn't heard about that before, but mm -hmm. there was a for the entire for the entire award. Yeah, on, on so top of the tax. I think it's a cool thing. I mean, so actually, though, let's. Uh, what are the airlines, the Amex transfer partners that have that uh, charge high fuel surcharges or high that pass on surcharges like that carrier imposed charges? Let's call those. So you get pretty sure any of the obvious currencies pass on surcharges, right? Uh, Singapore, no, Singapore doesn't anymore. Uh, Aeroplan or uh, ANA rather passes them on, right? Yeah. Um, uh, Air France and Flying Blue, yeah, yeah, Flying yeah. Blue. Yeah. I don't, I don't think Asian we miles? know of all the all Asian the different. Miles? Yeah, I bet Aero Mexico does. Maybe I don't know. Yeah, who's ever booked an award with Aero Mexico? <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> no idea. <laughs> um, yeah, so well, there aren't that many. All right. Let's move on. I'll, uh, I'll interrupt uh, the banter on that one uh, to move on to question 12 from Jose Santiago. He's got a series of interesting questions. I'm going to summarize to the last piece here. Do the outsized welcome bonuses offered on points and miles cards still make the points and miles game more lucrative than the cash back game? Or is cash back the way to go? Hmm. And he, oh, yeah, he refers to um, economy flyers. Right. Well, For someone who's not looking for the like crazy luxury wants to do you know modest four-star accommodations etc this one to me i would say that it's more valuable to do points and miles than it ever has been right now because the the barrier to entry for economy flights and for modest accommodations at least domestically i'm assuming this is a domestic domestic question so we're talking about the u.s um you know i, I if you're looking to travel right now that the the, the twenty thousand you know the to me, just traveling around right now, the cash per the cents per point or the the, the 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 cash per point value that you're getting is almost at a record high in many currencies, simply because the cash prices are so high. And so, if you were to go start booking um, any almost any domestic travel using cash back, you would be spending, in my opinion, more than you would be from using a in almost any of the airline currencies 
and certainly many of the hotel currencies, just because everything's so expensive right now. And that's kind of the barrier to entry, like the economy is expensive and the basic hotels are expensive. So I would actually say, in my opinion, I think it's probably more valuable than it's ever been for that type of traveler. And for the points and miles, you, know, you can go for, yeah, for the points like a hybrid approach as well, a little bit like we did with um, three cards, three continents draft, where we chose some cards that have high sign up bonuses, like the city premier card, but you can then use that for cash back if you want, but then right. you also have the flexibility of transferring that to airlines as well. Um, if you do find a better deal um, by using miles instead of um, cashing out the points. So I'd say, yeah, it's still absolutely worth um, doing that just because the cashback cards generally don't have much of a sign up bonus in terms of just pure cashback. So it's often like two, 300 bucks or something like that. Oh. Yeah, there are many cashback bonuses that can compete with the size of the bonuses on transferable currency cards and you can cash them out, like Stephen said. So, you know, you look at the, like the Amex gold card, I mean, 90,000 points for goodness sake, even if you cash that out, uh, that's still a, a decent amount of money. And if you use them for awards of any sort, even at a penny a point, uh, then you're, you're doing really well. So yeah. better than a cashback. And then uh, on the hotel front, uh, as Tim alluded to, yeah. you know, it, especially if you if you go with hotel chains that still mm -hmm. have uh, uh, award charts, so basically Hyatt and Radisson, and Choice, I guess <laughs> there's not many left, but um, you know, the the value you're getting these days from those points has been going through the roof, especially with Hyatt's been even with Marriott. Insane. Like, it's Marriott so easy. IG, too. I've been getting great, Honestly, great. Value. Yeah. Well, Marriott, I think, I think we're still seeing that because they haven't gone yeah. full dynamic, Fully dynamic on us yet. Yeah. Yeah. So, but, but so still, this year at least yeah, this we year still have, yeah, still time. getting some great value there. Yep. Yeah. Well, and Greg, Greg, when you looked at Marriott too, and not to belabor this point, but when you looked at Marriott, the, the highest value was at the most modest lot, um, accommodations over the all overall wasn't it it was the high-end accommodations that were most effective uh, yeah the, i mean it wasn't necessarily like modest but but ones that were sort of not at the top of the top of the top right, right. like because right. those were the ones that kind of blew out um from where they used to be value wise but um yeah no i mean the cost I mean, of hotels right now yeah i totally it's agree. just amazing yeah, it's, yeah, yeah it's, it's just so crazy how high they've gotten especially in sort of desirable vacation destinations. It's just yeah. nuts. Yeah. yeah. Um, got another kind of follow-up <clears throat> question from Andrew Ross. Um, with things constantly changing, which airline transfer partners, and that he was the one who asked the Amex question, so I think that's what he means, non-domestic legacy carrier have the most generous cancellation policy for getting back miles and taxes and fees without an additional change fee? If something unforeseen happens, I guess. Yeah. The first one that comes to mind is ANA because I think the fee is three thousand miles, right? That's right. And so that's that's pretty cheap as far as getting everything back. British Airways and Virgin Atlantic, if the uh, the taxes and fees were less than fifty five dollars on your original ticket, then you just get the miles back and theoretically you forfeit the taxes and fees that you paid. So for example, if you book a domestic American Airlines flight with British Airways Avios, which is like really hard to do right now, but, it, but if you did, it'd be $5 and 60 cents in tax. And theoretically you would forfeit that $5 and 60 cents. But in practice, I think a lot of times they refund that. So you don't end up paying anything on, on Avios tickets that have very little in tax. If it's more than that, then it's $55 to cancel. So that's not necessarily super cheap anymore. Anything else come to mind, guys? Flying Blue, I think they were great, but I think they just changed that recently, didn't they? I don't remember. Right? They're, they're not $50 anymore? They, they were like 50 well, euros well, or something? Before there was, they had suspended that for a while, but I think they just reinstituted it last month. Hmm. That could be. Um, and I know because but I, mean, I, that's, I, I had to that, cancel my book, I think five or six uh, flying blue flights in May on the same trip. Uh -huh. um, and there was no charge at that point. But I remember looking gotcha. at it at the okay. time, and I think they just reinstituted that. Mm. Right, right. right. But they were great for a time. Yeah. Right, right. But I mean, that's still friendly compared to, yeah. you know, $200 or so that like 
life miles charges I, I, you know yeah and if we're talking that then singapore has got a you know something in the, in the same 50 ish dollar range i think it used mm-hmm. to be like 20 but they yeah they used to point. be really good yeah mm-hmm. uh so i mean quite most of them are reasonable right i mean like one of the ones that have expensive change fees life miles sometimes and air canada and air canada yeah those are your two expensive change and cancellation fee policies i think that i can think of that that we can think of offhand yeah yeah Got a question that will probably end up going to Nick. <laughs> um, Adam Rogers says, with a family of four, international business class seems out of reach, both for cost and availability. What are some strategies uh, that I should be pursuing now uh, that they aren't lap infants anymore, uh, besides just earning and burning loads of Amex points? Well, yeah, I mean, that's the best thing to do. And, you know, and that's the first thing that came to mind when you said business class is out of reach. I was thinking to myself, Amex is making it pretty easy these last couple of years. So, you know, even though obviously it's it's not cheap to fly four people in business class, but even still, like I booked the those Air Europa flights just recently and there was a, I think there was a transfer bonus to flying blue. And so maybe it cost me 190,000 Amex points, I think for four people one way, or maybe it was even fewer than that. Maybe it was 192 uh, um, flying blue points, I think is what it was. Cause the kids between two and 12 get a 25% discount on long haul awards with flying blue. And and if you fly Air Europa, then you don't pay all the fuel surcharges that they charge on Air France and KLM. So that's, I think, a good option because if you find those rewards that are 55000 per person, you're only paying 41000 in change for the kids. And so you know, one big Amex sign-up bonus basically almost covers four people in business class one way. You know, If you open the business gold with 130 k offer, or the Amex Platinum with 150 k offer, et cetera. So, uh, so I think looking for those types of things or other similar award chart anomaly sweet spots. I, Tap Air Portugal has not released very much award space in recent memory, but they have that one sweet spot from New York. It's either JFK or Newark. I can't remember which to Lisbon. And it's like 35,000 miles each way in business class. Uh, so, And that's something where I've seen four seats a number of times. Emirates often has four seats. So there are some options that have four seats, but that does require a lot of miles. So then your, your backup plan there is flying premium economy. And if um, Air France ever releases availability to Virgin Atlantic again, that's a good option for getting to and from Europe. And, and using Avios to fly Japan Airlines from the West Coast to Asia can be decent value and premium economy. So that's another potential option for you. I don't know if anybody else have a different thought. I just, in terms of availability, I think also just watch for the blog posts that come out yeah. that say, you know, wide open availability from, you know, DC to, Dul- to uh, Dublin or whatever it is. And, you know, I know it's not easy being flexible with the whole family, but right. that's the time to jump on and try to book four tickets. Yeah. And I mean, just this year, I booked four of us using American Airlines miles to Europe recently, uh, you know, on American Airlines. And those were cheap miles that I bought with the Simply Miles deal we wrote about last year, because you could buy lots of uh, American Airlines miles really cheap with that. Then I booked four back uh, from, well, actually, I should say, yeah, four back from Europe later this year using Flying Blue. I had booked four on Delta to Amsterdam that I'm going to cancel with uh, Virgin Atlantic. Uh, so, I mean, I am still finding four seats on Flying on flights that you just have to be flexible and be willing to look hard and search a lot. And also like keep an eye out for decent paid rates on business class flights, especially to Europe, because often um, Tap Air Portugal has like incredibly cheap round trip flights. And so if it's possible to um, book those um, via Amex and you have a business platinum card, then that reduces even further how many points you need to redeem for those kind of options too so that's just another possible option because then you're not reliant on award availability that's a great point i've recently just recently looked at this and tap air portugal on some routes from europe to the united states is under 900 dollars one way in business class so if you're using points that's like at one and a half cents a piece whether it's ultimate rewards with the sapphire reserve or amex points with the business platinum then you're talking around 60 even a little bit less than sixty thousand miles one way per passenger not looking for award availability and earning miles on the flight great deal we've i've i booked that as low a few years ago it's like 480 dollars one way in business class from europe so that's i think that's a really good point that steven makes to take a look at paid flights especially how's, ones how's that how's that product nick i've never flown tapper. it was 
it wasn't, I mean, it was as nice as anybody else is flying to and from Europe in business class. I mean, it was there. It's relatively new on the flights that they're flying from Europe now. So it's the same type of a product that you find on, uh, on Iberia or really the same type of seats you see on Swiss, except I've flown Swiss a couple of times and the planes that I've been on have all been kind of older and beat up and the tap air Portugal one was relatively new comparatively. So, uh, the product was totally fine. It's not amazing by any stretch. It's not like, you know, the ANA room or whatever that they're flying now or, or the Q suites or something like that, but compared to what everybody else flies from Europe, I'd be happy to fly it again. Great. Switching gears here. <clears throat> um, David Wisinski says, I heard on an old podcast that Vacasa Redemptions might be capped at $350 for a one bedroom when booking with points. Is this true? Because I don't see any language on Wyndham or Vacasa's site stating this. Yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's true uh, based on observations that a lot of people have made that, that, um, when you go to try to book a Vacasa vacation rental with Wyndham points, if the, uh, is it the average room rate, Nick? I, yes, I'm trying to remember. The average, it's, yep. It's the, it's average the average room rate for your stay um, exceeds $350. They're likely to tell you that that place is not available for points at that time. But ironically, if you then like expanded your stay to longer to include like cheaper dates to bring the average down, suddenly it, it may be uh, available because it would be less than 350 per night then. Mm -hmm. So yeah, and it, it's based on the, the rate before like the cleaning fees and stuff like that. So you, you're still going to get better if you get even close to $350. Uh, room rate, you're still going to get much better than $350 like total value because of the other fees that are you're you not going to have other to pay fees, yeah. Yeah. Right, when you use points. Yeah. All right. We've got another one from Jose Santiago. Does the 35% rebate on the Amex Business Platinum Economy Flights... Uh, wait, does the... 35% rebate on the yeah. Amex Business Platinum Economy Flights on your chosen airline apply only to flights booked on that airline's metal for the entire itinerary, or does it also work on code share flights? Good question. Anybody able to answer uh, that? I don't know that. Answer the answer to that. I'm, I'm sure it would work. I'm sure it would work on uh, if if the airline you chose is marketing that flight. I'm sure it would work, um, but I haven't tried it. Is yeah, that what you were going to say, Tim? Shows, if it shows up on that itinerary, if you're able to book the itinerary through Amex as an itinerary, as an American Airlines itinerary, right. for instance then that will apply. And to make that clear, what he means is that it would have all American Airlines flight numbers. And so it'll say AA flight 5263, and it might in small print say operated by British Airways. But if it says AA flight, if that's the flight number, AA 56, you know, 23 or whatever, then, then that's an American Airlines marketed flight. If it says flight BA 1762, then that's not an American Airlines flight, right? So then maybe it might not. But that was, really that was a really sure. good, that was a really good uh, addition there. <laughs> yeah. Good so, clarification, Nick. Hopefully. Uh, question from Carl Williams here takes us in a totally different question uh, uh, direction now. Um, do you think the proliferation of Facebook miles and points groups have made the average miles and points person lack fundamentals? <laughs> this should be some interesting, <laughs> interesting discussion here. I want to know what the fundamentals are. <laughs> yeah, what are the fundamentals? That'd be nice. I mean, I guess actually we know the fundamentals, right? Because we we had some ideas in mind of what we wanted Tim to know about when we when we hired him, right? So I guess we do yeah. have, but yeah, I don't, I don't have any opinion here. Anybody have an idea here? You know, I I think that this is to me what what I like about the proliferation, and I'll just take a stab at this real quickly, and I'm gonna and I'm gonna I'm sort of punting on the question a little bit. But to me, I think the most important thing in, in the points and miles world when we get into this is less about what you know, and it's more about who you know. And who you know can be the groups that you're involved in. It can be the blogs that you read. It can be um, a lot of people, or it can be a lot of different things. But you know, I don't know. You know, if you took the average airline program, um, and you could probably pick almost anyone out of the out of the air, literally, and um, probably there's somebody that is a reader of ours that knows more about it than we do. Um, so it's not necessarily that we all know the, all of the ins and the outs. It's not necessarily about knowing all the ins and the outs or whatever. 
I think it's more about being able to pool the knowledge within different groups to be able to collectively earn more, fly more, travel better, et cetera. And so that's what I like about the proliferation of those groups is that I think it gives more opportunity for community to build around all of us trying to figure out the ins and the outs of these different programs and, and redemption ideas and cashback portals and so forth. And I think that collective knowledge actually kind of enriches everybody. Um, and admittedly, there's some frustration, you know, I, I can see why there's frustration within that for those that have been there for a while. But I mean, you know, uh, we were all there at some point as well, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, yeah, I was going to say, like, we all started off at some point with not knowing anything about it. And some of us are faster learners than other people. And um, they, I think it's ultimately a good thing that more people are going to be able to travel more because they're going to be learning more about points and miles. And I'd also say that although there might be a lot of newbies in groups, a lot of people will start learning about stuff and then just kind of fall by the wayside just because it ends up if it can feel like it takes a lot of learning and some people just simply aren't interested in that in the first place, but hopefully them joining a Facebook group will encourage them to actually learn a bit more rather than just give up at the first kind of like frustration of not knowing something. So uh, uh, my friend Dave has a question he's wanted interjected and that's a perfect segue. <laughs> <laughs> well, Dave, we said hi. Hi Dave. He's out, <laughs> off of the other room, but uh, so perfect segue he considers himself a, a once pro now has been uh and so he's kind of he knows all the fundamentals but no longer knows kind of the what's recommended now so he wants to know what card should he get if he knows all the stuff uh but is under 524 and kind of in the market for a, a good sign up the Liverpool card list card. <laughs> <laughs> You'll never forgive me if I don't. <laughs> uh, we jest about the Liverpool. Don't anybody out there listening? We're not, we're not really saying the Liverpool. Well, okay. Stephen, <laughs> nobody even right. outside of Stephen. Some, some uh, it's person. okay. Like you can hate on the Liverpool card list card. You're just not allowed to hate on Liverpool. Liverpool. Okay. <laughs> Noted. Noted. Yeah. Uh, I mean, Dave, I, yeah. Dave knows Dave knows so much that he, he can make good use of points and stuff. So, I mean, what, what he needs to know is that Amex has been the gravy train lately and he should jump on all these amazing business platinum business gold type of offers. Um, it won't bump him over 524. So it'll keep him uh, it'll keep him able to jump on uh, like a chase personal card or, or well, or multiple chase business cards um, if uh, the offers look tempting to him, but there's no reason for him not to go after those. Um, the, he, and he can get them multiple times because Amex keeps doing these business offers where they say, expand your membership and they let you get another one of these cards and get the sign up bonus again. And if he hasn't been playing the game much recently, he might even be able to get the Amex Platinum card if it's been seven years or um, however long since he last had yeah. it. Um, and so that's another option, even if um, he didn't want the business card. And how about a specific recommendation for one that's good for like daily spend, everyday spend? Hmm. That would still apply? I guess the Amex subscription bonus, yeah. Yeah, or sign up on like maybe may city premier if he spends a lot on groceries and um, gas and travel or something maybe um but i think that'll, but, but that'll, like just putting everyday spend on a sign up bonus card would probably yeah. make more sense for the most part yeah that'll give yeah. our uh, newbie friend dave something to start with anyway <laughs> uh, <laughs> this is so, the guy that 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 each year at the chicago seminars runs the uh, beginners boot camp and does a presentation right. on how miles <laughs> <and> <laughs> He's looking for some material. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. So next up, we've got a question from Iptahar. Can you downgrade Premier? This has a bunch of uh, uh, abbreviations that I, I'm not going to, I'm just going <laughs> to say the abbreviation. Can you downgrade Premier to DC and Double keep cash. the points alive since now it earns thank you points? If not, can you first downgrade to rewards plus and PC to DC to keep the points alive? product change to double cash um, I, I, I thought i yes, knew that can, one yes you can don't downgrade to the double cash and keep your points alive it's a good reminder we, we have a few resource posts that um suggest that you can't downgrade to uh the the double cash without losing your points so you need to find those and change them <laughs> <laughs> 
All right, you guys answered too quickly and I haven't pulled up the next question. <laughs> so I'll read this one and if it's not. Uh, All right, well, while you're doing that, uh, let me just explain to people who don't know the, the yeah, whole double cash do. thing that um, the thing is double cash used to be primarily a cash back card and it added at some point along the way a way to turn that cash back into thank you points, but it was still a cash back card. So at that time, if you product change from a city premiere to the double cash, you lost your, your thank you points. And, uh, but now uh, the double cash is fully a thank you card. It earns thank you points um, directly, not cash back. You can cash them out though. Um, so now that it's a thank you card, you should be able to safely downgrade without losing your points. One thing to clarify, though, I guess, is that if you have the double cash, you can't transfer to travel partners, um, but you do still retain the thank you points so that they can be used in the future. So uh, this is a great question I'm going to have to uh, skip to just because it really catches my attention. Uh, Derek Woods says, which of you have had the craziest experience this year on an airplane? <laughs> <laughs> I don't. I don't think I've had any crazy experiences on an airplane. You, you had a crazy experience getting up to the airplane. Yeah, like getting, getting to the plane. It was crazy. <laughs> <laughs> Do you want to tell that story, Nick? Well, yeah, I, I feel I, like I, 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 could. I could. Well, so I, I booked, I booked an American Airlines flight through British, well, through uh, through Amex Travel. I booked a business class on American Airlines, traveling from uh, from Milan to New York, but. I booked it with a British Airways flight number we were talking about before. So it was a British Airways marketed flight operated by American Airlines. Uh, and so I booked the ticket through Amex Travel so I could use the business platinum pay with points rebate. But then I wanted to add a lap infant and I couldn't do it through Amex Travel because British Airways has this crazy thing where if your lap infant turns two during the trip, they need to have a seat once they're two years old. And most airlines will require that you pay for a seat for them. But British Airways and Virgin Atlantic will allow you to book them as a lap infant if they turn two during the trip. And they'll give you a seat for free on the segments after they turn two. So that's why I booked the British Airways ticket and why I had to call British Airways to add my lap infant son because he was turning two uh, over the course of this trip. Right. So I did that back in May. And then when I was going to check in the night before the flight last week, I realized, oh, my lap infant son, his name isn't on the confirmation anywhere. What's going on here? And go back into my email, pull up his confirmation number on the British Airways site. And it says there are no flights in this booking. I'm like, what do you mean there are no flights in the booking? I have the email. I paid for the, the lap infant fee. It was like 290 bucks or something. So uh, that doesn't make any sense, right? So I called British Airways. Well, for, I tried to call British Airways and the phone numbers were all closed. The ones in Europe were all closed because it was late at night and the one in the United States gave me a recording saying, no, we can't uh, take a call right now. You got to call back some other time. And I was like 12 hours from the flight. So I got on with the Twitter team and the Twitter team eventually helped me realize that what happened was the original agent who booked the lap infant, I was flying on July 9th and they booked him on June 9th instead of on July 9th by mistake. So I assume he, he missed that flight and the rest of his itinerary got canceled. So now he had no flights in his itinerary, right? But but I hadn't gotten a refund or anything. So, okay, so let's fix that. Let's get him on the right thing because the lap infant can't fly without anybody. And I spent hours on Twitter with the Twitter team and they eventually just stopped responding after telling me over and over again, they're working on getting it fixed. They stopped responding. So then on the way to the airport, I start harassing them again on Twitter saying, we got to get this fixed because he doesn't have a ticket. And so literally as I got in the elevator at the airport to go up to the check-in counter, I got the message from British Airways saying, okay, ticket has been reissued. He's good to go. You're going to be on the flight. No problem. And, and at this point, it's two hours before departure. I get to the check-in desk and they tell me, no, he's not in the system. He's not listed anywhere. So you can't get on the flight. You got to go to the ticketing desk and get this figured out. So then I go and I sit and wait at the ticketing desk. And of course that takes forever. So I can't get up to the front counter. And, and eventually everybody that's checking in for the flight is gone. Like all the economy class people. And I get a manager to help us out, get this fixed, figure it out. And finally, uh, it was 15 or 20 minutes before boarding was scheduled to start. We had our boarding passes and dropped off our bags. We still had to get through security, had to get through passport control, had to get to the gate. So what a mad dash that was. We were running through the airport, strollers in hand, long lines, of course, because anybody who's traveled lately knows long lines everywhere, right? So we literally got to the gate as they were pulling the thing across to close the flight and uh, and got on the plane, thankfully. Like they were pulling in a clock crying. We said, no, 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 we're on this flight, we're on this flight. So we're the last people on the flight, get on the flight. We're like, okay, great, we made it. 
get all the way to New York. Okay, we're here. We go go through immigration. I tried to use mobile passport. So I've used that for a long time. And it's, it's giving me an error saying you got to go see an agent. I don't understand why. But I get up to the agent. And so he scans you know, my, me and my wife and my four year old. Then he gets to my lap infant son who's less than two. And he's like, what flight were you guys on? And so I told him and he said, what was the flight number? I told him and he looks at it, he tells me that the lap infant wasn't on the flight manifest. <laughs> so I was like, what do you mean he wasn't on the flight manifest? We were, we were just on the back. flight. <laughs> right. <laughs> that caused more confusion. They weren't done ruining my day yet. So then, of course, they had to you know, get separated for through uh, border control, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, yeah. Eventually they gave up and they were like, OK, you know what? Just go ahead. Take them. Uh, so, so we got back oh. in, thankfully. But yeah. That was it. How were your kids handling this? You know, the flight, they did remarkably well. I'm amazed because we got to the airport and we hadn't eaten breakfast because our hotel had already or had not started breakfast by the time we had to leave the hotel. We were planning to eat in the lounge, uh, but of course, couldn't get through to get to the lounge and didn't have any time to stop there. So we had no breakfast. My two year old had been in the same diaper for like four hours already at this point. <laughs> I hadn't had a chance to change it because couldn't walk away from the counter. Right. So, uh, so yeah, I mean, like uh, considering all of that, they were remarkably good. And then we got to, of course, a long line at, at the, the, um, the you know, immigration in the United States and they didn't do so well with the long line. I got to say <laughs> long line that didn't, they didn't go over well with the kids, but, uh, but luckily, you know, we made it through, we made it through all well like that ends. Well, it was, it was a headache. It was definitely Derek a Woods British Airways. must know you personally and just he knew to like feed that question <laughs> <laughs> not impressed with British Airways uh, they were very oh yeah it's all fixed it's done and then of course they don't respond at all when I'm like okay they tell me it's not fixed yeah, I'm sitting here waiting at the ticketing counter what's brutal. going on guys and of course you know no response until we get on the plane yeah brutal <laughs> Yeah, and usually traveling with kids is like a total breeze. So that's right, you know, right, unfortunate right. Yes, you yes. had to. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> so uh, speaking of uh, family travel, we've got a question from Jane Carter. For a family of five wanting lounge access, would you rather have a Chase Ritz-Carlton or a Cap One Venture X? I'm, I'm going to jump out and say Venture X. Yeah. Oh, what were you, what were you going to say? I was just going to say, does a Venture X priority pass let you have um, five people coming in? Because if it does, then I'd definitely choose. Oh, okay, it's two. Okay. But, but it then lets you, you have free authorized, oh, it lets you have free authorized yeah. users. Oh, right. So you could, give yeah, each of your, you could give each of your family members an authorized user card and they could get in yeah. not only to priority pass, but also to Capital One lounges and uh, what what's that other one? Uh, that Plaza they just, Premium. Plaza, Plaza Premium, Premium lounges. Mm -hmm. That's why I would pick that one. That's true. That's a yeah. good reason to pick that one. Question though, is there a minimum age for authorized users on Capital One? I know the uh, answer to that on most know. issuers. I don't know on Capital One. Well, but if you had, if even if the player two That's true. was an authorized user, you'd then get six total because you'd have oh, two. Oh, because you get the two cast each. So you'd be, you'd be all you need is one authorized user. One authorized user, yep. Yep, for the yeah. family of five. Makes sense. Good, Next good catch up, there. a uh, fairly specific question. Uh, hope I get all these details right. Uh, Mick Chen says, I just booked a one-way Japan Airlines business class from JFK to Jakarta uh, for $1,361. And after the $300 off Amex offer, it's only $1,061. $1, How do I calculate the American Airline miles I'll be earning? It'll be on where, the value. Where to credit.com. Um, uh, and look up your fare class. Like you, you, it does, forget about the three hundred dollars Amex offer. That's got nothing to do with anything. Uh, mm -hmm. you, you just want to look at the fare class and where to credit dot com will give you an idea. It should anyway whether that will credit as uh, or, or whether you'll earn X number of miles per dollar spent or some other thing, right? Which is probably what's going to be some other thing, I assume. Uh, or just you're going to have to Google American Airlines earning on so it's JFK to Jakarta. I, they don't fly to Jakarta, right? So you're flying on some partner. Uh, so you're Japan gonna Airlines. Up, oh, Japan Airlines. I missed that. So mm -hmm. if you look up Japan Airlines and the fare class, you should be able to see on the American Airlines website how they handle that fare class, right? Yeah. I mean, I took the question to mean like, would it be calculated based on the 1361 or the 1061? So it'll be based okay. on the 1361 because, yeah, the Amex offers separate. But yeah, if you're wanting to work out specifically how much, then yeah, like what Nick was saying. And do that calculator based on the 1361. Yeah, if but, it's an American but Nick's Airlines point, Stephen, is, is that it, it, he, since they're not flying American Airlines, 
it might not be based on the uh, like well, see, yeah, five okay. miles per dollar type right. Of right. Okay, I see right. what I mean. Yeah. Right. Right. And and so maybe a percentage of the cost miles flown or, or something. Miles flown. Yeah. yeah, I can't remember off the top of my head. Same. Yeah. All right. Uh, another one from Jose Santiago. Any chance Amex will offer a retention bonus if I threaten to cancel my everyday preferred or is a downgrade to the fee-free everyday the only realistic option? That was a great cool. chance. I'd ask, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I got one last month, in fact, on that very same thing. Oh, so you, you used up those retention offers then already. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> but, but there have been data points of people getting retention offers on no annual fee cards. And so yeah, yeah. The fact that no. this does have a fee, then it's only worth a try. Nope. Yeah, my wife got a retention bonus on it a couple of years ago. I, I didn't even try the last time. I'm not sure how long it's been. I didn't even try the last time because we've we've been getting enough value anyway out of, uh, you know, in our case, it's getting referrals on the card. So I, I didn't even ask for the retention bonus. But but yes, people have been reporting retention bonuses on just about every single Amex card. Is there an Amex card you yeah. haven't heard any retention data points on? I don't know. Maybe there is, but I don't know anybody who's tried. Uh, the Centurion card. card, maybe? <laughs> yeah. yeah. I, actually, I definitely well, ask. Well, one thing to add, though, is that depending on the offer that you get, it might still be worth downgrading to the everyday card, just because Amex has been That's sending true. out a lot of the upgrade offers to go from the everyday to the back up to the everyday preferred. That's often like up to 40,000 membership rewards, in which case, so if all they're going to offer you is a like $95 statement credit or something like that to effectively waive the annual fee, it might still be worth downgrading That's to the everyday point. card just so that you have that potential option because they seem to be quite generous with sending that out. That's a great point. But the one other thing I want to say is that my answer to this question is always uh, that you hit 0% of the balls you don't swing at. So is there any chance? There's no chance if you don't ask. So you might as well ask if, you know, and find out what you're working with. But I think Stephen's right. It probably makes more sense to downgrade and, and, get, and do the upgrade later. All right. Uh, I think we still have time for a few more. Uh, Nicholas Becker um, is wondering if we have recommendations or comments for what is the gateway to getting into some of the private groups and meetups, which can help with some of these more uh, complicated things? Uh, in, in his full question, I think he references some kind of MS-related stuff. Hmm. I don't know that we can share those secrets or have those <laughs> secrets. Or... <laughs> uh, if we don't have too much to say on that, uh, I've got another. Uh, I, I mean, I, I'd say like a starter point would be to go to things like Chicago seminars, um, frequent travel at university, and get chatting to people there because um, that can be a really good way of like learning some things and meeting up with people and making connections. Um, so that's one possible way of doing that. I made friends at some of those things that I'm like Facebook friends with. And I'm always amazed at the things that I see where I'm like, oh, this person knows that person and, and this other person, like uh, they got together. Uh, so, uh, you know, that's the way these circles work, you know. So, uh, so Stephen's totally right. That's how you, you make connections by going to the, some of those in-person things. It's worth investing in a weekend at the Chicago seminars or an FT or something like that. Uh, it can pay dividends over the, the long haul. That's, that's how you get Dave on your futon. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Find out everybody uh, knows everybody. <laughs> I think uh, you guys can let me know if this should be the last. Um, we've got, I, don't, I did not write down who this is from. Any guesses on if Chase will have any all-time high signup bonuses now that Amex is kip kicking up their game? Does Chase ever follow suit with Amex on all-time high signup bonuses? I don't think so. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, the, you know, Chase and Amex both kicked things uh, way up like about a year ago um, when they, you know, started. Actually, Chase might have actually started off like the pandemic, um, yeah. you know, big bonus uh, uh, party uh, with, with things like the Bonvoy. 550k nights and um united quest card the, i think it was like a really yeah. high bonus early yeah. on yeah yeah and the sapphire preferred 80k seemed like a huge thing at that time um you know and then then amex was like no hold my beer <laughs> i've got this <laughs> and then blew them out of the water um so i i mean i i don't see chase escalating things any more than they already have 
No, no, no. It, it feels like Chase is more trying to go for your everyday spend um, than necessarily mm -hmm. Amex is just because they have these quarterly spending bonuses where it seems like they're trying to capture that, whereas Amex is trying to capture the new cards by offering a whole ton of points um, on each one. So mm -hmm. I, I wouldn't expect to see Chase increase stuff, but it would certainly be nice if they did. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Wow. What do you guys think? Uh, decent place to wrap up. We've got other questions, but they're all fairly um, in depth. So, uh, any closing thoughts? Go Liverpool. <laughs> <laughs> Just stop the card list card. <laughs> the definitive word does the English breakfast include black pudding and haggis or not? <laughs> not for me, it doesn't. <laughs> if it yeah, food, that... I put it on my plate, but I can't guarantee that I'll end up. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, thanks everyone for joining us. And at our first uh, all team, ask us anything. And if you enjoyed this, let us know. And we'll hopefully uh, be able to do this every time, I, I think. Um, so, uh, yeah, uh, thanks for joining us. And we'll be back in about a month to do another one. Bye, everybody. Bye, Bye everyone. Bye-bye.